Joining us, we have the one and only, again, we have Mateus' favorite guitar player since he was 18. We have John fucking Christ. John, how are you, buddy? I, I like that. Can you say my name that way again? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> let me oh, put that on my voicemail. John fucking Christ. John, let me introduce you. So, John, that's Matthias. Matthias in the dancing Mateus. shirt. That's Simon, uh, the guy with the big beard. Hey, Simon with the big beard. Yeah, and that's and that's Andreas, the, the voice of Vinosaur. I don't know how you sing clean and scream like that. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge, especially at the live occasions, but yeah, a lot of it. Hey, John, uh, in 2002 or 2001, Andreas traveled to America to get Steve DiGiorgio's bass tracks. Would Andreas travel back to America to get John Christ <laughs> guitar tracks? <laughs> I would say that's a good start, or I could come to him if he wants to play, pay my airfare. Oh. <laughs> if Andreas would have never posted that picture of him behind the computer with the Danzig flag, I would have never written a comment. But I did. I said, nice flag. And then Andreas liked it, and I was like, who? Hi, hey, John, John, John. Yeah, that's John, the flag. Look. The flag is still, <laughs> it's alive still. <laughs> John, do you see it? I see it. I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> if he's yes. a Danzig fan, he must have been difficult to live with on tour. We are childhood friends, so uh, I guess we can cope. We have our difficulties, I guess. On the tour, on that picture, I'm sitting on front of the dancing flag, uh, writing the, the album, the Cosmic Genesis album, the Winter Sorg album, and Matthias has always been the uh, more greater dancing fan than me, but I still love it, of course. Uh, so Matthias knows all the details, all the recording studios, all the <laughs> that kind of so stuff. how many songs on the album, which songs on the album. I, I've been like, oh, this is fine. this is sounds nice. I've been that kind of fan, I guess. Are you telling me Matthias is the number one John Christ fan of Sweden? Ah, I, I thought Ingve Malmsteen was. Oh, oh well, man. In, was it Ingve Malmsteen was the John Christ fan of Sweden? <laughs> 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 no, 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 it's just, uh, you know, Ingve. not only is he famous, he's infamous. And I hated him growing up as a teenager because when Rising Force came out, it was shortly after Joe Satriani came out with Surfing with yeah. the Alien. Eric Johnson had Cliffs of Dover. Uh, Van Halen had like 1984. So I got to learn all of this new guitar crap. And then this Swedish guy <laughs> comes over playing like a violinist. So I was pissed off because it was so hard just to keep up with everything that was coming out, you know? Yeah. And he just took it up light years. So anyway, you know, my big accomplishment of, of those early years was learning Rising Force cover to cover and boring my friends with it. But years later, so I'm in Danzig, fast forward to say 93 or something, yep. I'm at a convention in LA and there are guitar clinics and stuff going on. And it, and it was like one of these concrete foundation things they did in, in, yep. uh, in the valley there, near the airport. And um, we're in the restaurant, I'm sitting there with a bunch of publicity people and he comes in with his wife and walks right up to the table in the middle of a conversation and says, uh, John from Denzig, right? I said, yes. And he goes, uh, I'm not a fan, but uh, my wife is. 
She likes your singer. She would, uh, you know, your music. It's not crap, but my life, my wife. She likes your singer. She likes your music. Can she have an autograph and a picture? And I was like, oh, of course, that's great. And I said, and then I said to him, and you are. <laughs> he looked at me kind of funny, shook his head, and I said, did your wife get the flowers I sent? <laughs> Open book. Matthias, let's have you start the first question. Oh well, <clears throat> first off, it's a huge honor for me to to talk to you. To, uh, when I was 18, if I had knew that I was going to talk to you on Christ one day, I would have <laughs> passed out. When, how old were you when you first heard Danzig? And what was the first song? Where were you? Paint the scene. I, I'm dying to know what kind of impact it had for you. Well, I came in to Danzig through Misfits. You know, okay. I first heard uh, Last Caress uh, Metallica cover. Yeah, and I thought that was a fucking brilliant song. So I checked that music out, and then I said, "Fuck, he is an excellent vocalist." Right. And then I started to follow into Sam Hain, and then uh, Dancing. And the, for me, Dancing is number one. Do you remember the first Dancing song you heard that you liked? Well, it was probably Mother. So, Matthias, what was the first dancing song you learned on guitar? Well, I don't know. Maybe She Rides, actually. Ah. I like that uh, kind of bluesy vibe going on there. So, what what was your favorite part of She Rides? Actually, the, the first uh, riff, you know. Because uh, the... Um... <laughs> I love the chugging part of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you this, when we went into the next part. Rick Rubin really liked those bands. I was trying to do something like, you know, and he's like, nah, too much. <laughs> Simon was not excited to meet me. He was waiting for you, John. Uh, listen, I must, I must confess, uh, James uh, um, is the first guy to introduce me to your group. And um, not only am I impressed with the musicianship and the musicality, but I'm looking forward to digging into your older stuff. I think there's a lot of great stuff there, and uh, you know, I, I wish you guys all the best. I'm sure you're amazing live. I just wanted to say that up front before I get all cocky and rock star out on you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mateus can die happily, you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a question to Jan. I'm not totally into all the details as well as Matthias is, but it, when you were writing songs, uh, did you did it? Did you do that with Glenn, or did you write? Okay, I write the guitar parts, and then he came in for the vocal lines, or how did it did it work out together? Or did he do some guitar parts, and then you trans kind of transcended that into your own guitar style, or how did well, that work out? On the first record, he already had some guitar parts worked out, but they nothing was complete. Right. Um, as each record went on, you know, by um, man, by the end of Lucifuge writing and then How the Gods Kill in the fourth record, it, he'd call me up on the phone and he would have a micro cassette recorder and he's yeah. going, rah, 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 you know, and I'm sitting <laughs> on the other end. I got, you know, I, oh, that's the right I course of that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm putting my telephone down on a pillow on my couch and I got my acoustic guitar and I'm listening and I'm kind of, you know, kind of chugging stuff out you know and i'm like 
You're you're doing what? You're you're chugging. And they say big chords on like this. It's like yeah 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 you know. Yeah. So, but in the in the in the very beginning, uh, when I got into the band, it was still Sam Hain. So there's yeah. a lot of rock stuff, and I like to tell the story of like there was a version of Mother there. I know it started off. It, 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 it wasn't like it wasn't that. It was. punk rock we still had it kind of heavy and then we got into the studio and rick rubin you know he'd been working with the cult been working with a bunch of r b stuff he's real bluesy rick was like a huge uh led zeppelin uh ac dc fan and all that so that's where we kind of found some common ground, you know. I see that Jack Daniels, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no. Matthias, oh. Matthias, you said something about the, the punk rock version of Mother. What were you saying? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's you can really hear the Sam Hain uh, style of it. Oh, in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the, in the very beginning, like, but, so what happened was, everything was fast, right? Everything was fast. And, you know, with Chuck Biscuits on drums, it's like he starts at 100 kilometers an hour and then he quickly accelerates to 160. You know, he's more comfortable up there. You know, and Rick Rubin was like, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. You know, so that was always a challenge. It was off to the races as soon as we went live. You know, we could never record anything live because it was unusable, you know, everything was so fast. Uh, but that, that was... The, the, the songwriting process in the early days, what would happen is, yeah, Glenn and I would get together, uh, we'd work on stuff, and then when we had a certain amount of material, uh, we would go down to the rehearsal studio, bring everybody in, and just with little the dual cassette decks, you know, we just put it up in the corner and we would jam, and when we got something close, all right, record that, record that, um, and then make copies for everybody and go home. Um, and then, near the end when we were doing uh stuff like for the last record it was very repetitious the songs didn't have as many parts so i would kind of you know, get together with glenn and then he would sing stuff out and i would just hear it and put it on the guitar it's like the human loop machine you know and yeah. he and rick would be there and i would just play a million different versions <laughs> I'd be like, that's kind of dark. I want to go to D. And they're like, no, leave that one, leave that one. You know, and there was their thing was, you know, I, I wanted to add more chunks, you know. And they're like, no, too much chunk. That's Metallica, blah, 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 you know, so yeah. blues, bluesier. So it was always frustrating for me because I was a guitar player and I want to play lots of notes, <laughs> play like it. Seen and impress everybody so yeah you know in the years leading up to you joining Samhain what albums was spinning on your record player ah <laughs> Judas Priest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Simon's not impressed, John. Oh. Yeah. Here's a 
song, one of the first songs that Erie and Chuck and I jammed on, that was Metallica. Um, because they were from punk rock. I was from rock and roll and heavy metal, right? So we didn't have a lot of common ground. You know, Erie, mm -hmm. Erie didn't know anything except punk rock. And, and Chuck, you know, he liked a lot of Who and Led Zeppelin. So, you know, um, you, we could do some of that. But I did everything. Now it sounds like Faith No More. You know what I mean? <laughs> Eerie like Metallica, so I was like, oh, do you know this one? He's like, I love that song. So we started playing a bunch of Master of Puppets and early Metallica stuff. Andreas and Mateus, and these guys are big gear nerds. So John, I think Andreas records from his home. Simon is now doing his bass on his home. We're all, we're all these kind of uh, bedroom recorders. But uh, of course, sometimes we, go, we need to go to the studio to do drum lever, depending on stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm sitting in my home studio right now. I, have, I can just do my vocals over here. As you see, here's not my. What kind of mic are you? Now <laughs> uh, this one is a uh, Röda. It's a Danish one. Okay. It's it actually. Looks like, it looks really, like a Neumann. Yeah, it looks like a Neumann. It's not a Neumann. It's kind of a. Uh, how should I put it? Uh, Neumann. Uh, no, is it a Neumann light? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a little bit that, but, but but sometimes I feel that that Röda mic is better than a Neumann. My for my voice, yeah, this has some siblings there. Uh, the, the Neumann is, of course, very soft and it captures uh, all the all the frequency bands. But this one is something with the siblings that I can't really get out of a Neumann, so it's depending on different and also depending on in which kind of pitch I'm singing. So it's yeah, it's yeah. all about, about gears, and I see you are quite geared up yourself at your place I so. got a, yeah i got a little bit of gear i got different levels you know um like the i brought the marshals out just because i thought you guys would like it yeah yeah, yeah. I got simon doesn't little, like it though i got a lady, <laughs> you, know, you know i even have a spark 40 practice amp on the floor Ooh, over there that sounds really? pretty good that i just bought um but yeah i you know i i appreciate what you're talking about with the microphones because Every human voice is different, yeah. and every microphone, I don't care if you had 10 of those exact microphones, um, of course, if you had 10 of them, I'm sure you would try each and every one of them singing the same line and trying to see which one you thought gave you just that little extra warmth or something. Yeah. It's nothing is created exactly equally. I mean, you know, there's so there's subtleties, and I think with listening to your recordings and the stuff you guys care about the quality so the you know the art is in those tiniest details yeah, yeah. Now, the sound is uh, it's a part of the art as well you know the art of the songwriting the lyric writing what you want to express tone wise um, text wise but also sound wise it's it's a part of the whole story of what you want to express so just saying, okay, we have a, we have a, uh, excellent instruments, we have a, a great lyrics, we have, a, yeah, yeah. But what are you doing with that? You know, you, the, that tone is crucial. Otherwise, you can just, yeah. Otherwise, it's robotics. Or... Well, part of it, you know, a question that I get asked by students a lot. I, yeah. I teach. Oh, I, that's I cool. That's cool. Yeah, I teach at some colleges and I teach locally in the internet, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But. Um, you know, I, a question that everybody's asked and they've written books about it is, what comes first, the music or the lyrics? And I always say, well, it depends. You know, it's never always the same. Um, you can do it either way, and it depends on where the inspiration comes from. But I was just curious, but some people tend to have a system like when you're starting to create then you're in writing mode and you you know the group is going okay here we go we're going do you have uh, a system do you have a routine that you like 
or do you just have your home studio with your computer and your 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 pens and pencils and all that how do you do it yeah for me it's more it's it's all of the above it's 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 like i have a home come home studio the computer is always on i always have the the recording program is uh, always on uh, I, i can just i get a kind of a oh ah this one this melody like you go in just jam it in for a second i can many times just sing it in on my phone uh, i can uh, many times just write some lyrics on the phone or on the computer so it's it's all of the, these different things and that, that's also for me it's very it's 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 in the in the form of how i prefer uh, how i perform the art i guess otherwise would be too much uh, kind of a machination if I was like okay it's always have to be I sit in front of a computer I write try to write the lyrics and then I take a guitar and try uh, it comes yeah. so from different angles some from yeah. different so and, and then you give it to Simon right yeah I like, give it to yeah. Matthias and did Simon and uh, then they work on those stuff it's interesting though because we're we're all trying to tap into the same universal source yeah. right we're yeah. all trying to get to that same spot where we forget about everything else and we just yeah. we just flow and it the ideas just start to come and you notice them and you don't try too hard and push and you see where it's going to lead you yeah. and then you start to get that little chill going oh wait a minute i feel something this feels good let's see where it yeah. goes and and you send it around and uh, i i tell my students you know read as many books as you can about songwriting and this and that i said it's changed over the years but one of my favorite lines is if you're a new songwriter or if you're trying to do something commercially don't bore us get to the chorus <laughs> <laughs> but the, but that also goes a little bit to what you have to do the work to get the inspiration. For me, it's more like if you start to work with music, you get the inspiration. I can't just sit sipping wine on the sunset and wait for the inspiration to come. You know, when you are starting working with music, ah, this one will lead to that one, and this melody will add up to this one, and then we get that chord, and then we get that harmony and stuff going. So it's it's also about doing the work. If you just sit and wait for inspiration, the, the universal is universal. <laughs> now, that answer, you just answered my first question. Yeah. Now. When I talked about routine, you said, oh, wait a second. Yeah, I do have a work ethic. Yeah. I do have a routine. I do like to be in my studio regularly. It's about uh, to have kind of annual stuff going on. Uh, but what I was referring to that first question was like, it's not the same routine every time. Sometimes yeah. I pick it up from a from a lyric part sometimes i pick it up from a and sometimes i also pick it up from a, from a actually sound if i, I put a push a keyboard sound up i have never heard that sound before that could also trigger something so sound as well is a trigger point i guess yeah well for me it's the uh, same as for andreas uh, some songs kind of write themselves when yeah. you start with it it's like it just comes out of nowhere and other songs you can get stuck in the park and I can't get any inspiration for it yeah. or anything and then you leave that song for a while and go back to it like a week later and then it's oh here it is so it's uh, always different you have a with dancing do you have did you have a full band rehearsals frequently or was it <laughs> Yeah, I I like to rehearse a lot. You know, um when we were in writing cycles, I at least twice a week, you know, we go into Hollywood and rehearse. We had a regular rehearsal space there. Yeah. And um the trick was always trying to get Glenn to show up and then get <laughs> Glenn Glenn and Rick Rubin to show up at the same time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, cuz Rick was always working with somebody. Uh um, yeah. And, but when they both showed up, it was great. And uh, a lot of times, you know, Glenn really didn't uh, finish any lyrics 
until we got to the recording studio. A lot of times, Buddy had this great knack for melody um, and, and pulling a melodic line out. So we would be playing chords and he would just be wailing in the background, you know. Yeah. And we would record that and he would listen to it. You know, the guy could scream for like 40 minutes straight, you know. go home and listen to that and then from that he would come up with ideas for songs and these just bizarre titles i'm like what pain <laughs> in the world what the hell is that you know <laughs> left hand black what the hell is that you know <laughs> when the dying calls i mean you know you need to get out and have some fun man yeah it was dark in regards to that uh the lyrics it's quite kind of a dark setting is painting up molded dancing albums uh, right? Yeah. And uh, how have you feel about that? Have you been like, okay, I'm just a guitar player, or I feel like I'm, we are a unity, I feel into this, or how, how, how has that been kind of? Well, that, you know, that was established um, early on. It was, okay, we're dark, you know, <laughs> we're, not, we're not happy smiles, love songs. You know, it's like, um, you know, I'm the one is a love song. Heart of the devil is a love song. Um, anything is a love song. Bodies is a love song. You know, it's got to be this over the top, yeah. you know, sexual driving stuff. You know, it's, there's no sweetness and and purity going on. And it was pretty heavy. And, you know, he told me up front, he's like, you know, I grew up on horror movies and stuff. I'm just really into it. He goes, you know, I was raised um, Italian, Scottish, Catholic, and I believe that there is a God and a devil, but I think the church is fucked up, and there are a lot of weird things in the Bible, and I like to write about that. And I said, okay, you know, and uh, would I have liked to change some directions later on once we matured? Yeah, of course I would have. Closest we got was, let me see. Uh, Tears. He did Sistinas. Yes. Yeah, uh, and then I think even Can't Speak was kind of you know soft like that. So yeah, there there just weren't two. That was a nice dynamic. You know, we might have one quieter song on the record, um, and then it's like okay, you know, got one. <laughs> got one out. There's my love song. Okay, I'm happy. I got a little question going back uh, to the beginning. See, oh. I got this, uh, I got this uh, live album. You got that bootleg, huh? Yeah, it's uh, from uh, 1989, live at the Palace in Hollywood. Oh, good show. And it's fucking awesome. It's really good sound as well. But, you know, on this album, you play a lot of, uh, like, misfit songs and uh, some Samhain stuff. And... Yeah, that was early on. Yeah. And... Uh... Let's see. I think that was before the second record. We have one record out, right? So yeah, yeah. There, there's you're going to have like London Dungeon. What are the other songs in there? Horror Biz, London Dungeon, Halloween. Uh, Last Caress. And you have uh, To Walk the Night. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's an old Sam Hain. Yeah. And When Death Had No Name. All right. <laughs> You know, that's a really good song. How come it didn't make it to the album? I don't know. I have no... <laughs> I always want it on there, you know. Uh, I, I think because I liked it so much. That's why. <laughs> uh, 
Johanna said the singer of which. Hey, Joanna. Your voice is awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. John's going to fly to Sweden to play Devil's Play thing. Could you uh, sing for him? <laughs> <laughs> so, Johanna, how many years have you been singing? Oh, since I was a child, I guess. What were some of the music tastes that you liked when you were younger that you still enjoy now? I actually liked Winter Joy a lot. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> what, what yeah, she of... she has been uh, playing with Winter Joy on a live occasion as well, right? Yes. Well, let me ask you, Joanna. What? When did you start to think, hey, you know what? I think I want to be the lead vocalist for a band. Uh, that's uh, maybe a dream as a child that I never thought would happen. Actually. <laughs> So what changed? What what? When did you say, you know what, I'm gonna do it? I don't know. When when you had an opening, I yeah. Uh, me me and Matte had our, our uh, Misfits Danzig uh, band going on for a few years, but uh, it all ended. <laughs> at a time uh, and we were talking about starting something something new together doing our own music and, and uh, just uh, keep on playing together uh, and that at that time we were looking for a singer and we didn't look for a female singer actually but uh, Johanna was stubborn and wanted to play with us okay <laughs> and, <laughs> so, uh, your solo album flesh caffeine you have a Swedish drummer, Stefan Svensson. The, yes, I call him Thor. How did you get him? Where, where is, what was his background? He, um, he was an LA studio drummer. Okay. And uh, there is, uh, let's see, there is a magazine, a musician magazine that was popular in LA. And I put ads out, you know, I was looking for some pro quality people and he came and tried out and he was great, and uh, and we hit it off. And um, you know, I I love Sweden when I was there. One of my sisters had been an exchange student in Skara, okay. and uh, you know, so he knew Skara. They were the uh, the benders. They had race horses. They were the ones that made all the ceiling, the roofing tiles, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was some connection to Sweden and. And, uh, and we hit it off, and what I liked about him was that, um, you know, he, he liked a lot of different things. It wasn't just a, a straight rock drummer, so he could think outside the box, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. That record is the first time I did a lot of drop D tuning, you know, I hadn't really yeah. done much before that. You know, here's the thing about Fledge Caffeine, like I said, I never claimed to be a singer. Fledge Caffeine! Um, and I was I was working on lyrics and I wrote some melodies and stuff and I had some other singers lined up and one by one they all backed out of the project so I I had to sing I was working with the engineer and we started doing vocals and he, he said I just don't think you have what it takes to sing and I was straining I, I went home and uh, my girlfriend and I we went to a local steakhouse that I love and I was at you know. I didn't drink, I was drowning my fears in iced tea and stuff. And there was a guy singing in the kitchen and I had him come out and it turned out he sang in the chorus of the LA Opera. And I, I said, do you give lessons? And he said, how much? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we came to an agreement. I took lessons for like six months and then I went back in and, um, you know, I uh, found an engineer that had Pro Tools so we could fly it in. I, yeah, yeah. I had good pitch and good feel, but I just didn't have the endurance and the breathing power to, to do that kind of thing. You know, it wasn't wasn't my skill set. So like I, I like to say, I made up for quantity what I lacked in quality. So hey, <laughs> we put so lots of harmony vocals on there. You know, there are a couple yeah. of songs, Shadows, I'm Gone, and 
uh, stop the world that have all these big layers of vocals that were a lot of fun to do. When you push your vocals, you have a really, you sound almost like James Hetfield. Like on the chorus of Tell Me Why, for example. Yeah. That's real. It's like James Hetfield is there. There's the difference. I, you know, I. That's one of the reasons why I had to uh, use drop D tuning because I can't hit a high E. Okay. <laughs> I can only get the D. Okay. And I wrote a couple of songs in B minor, and I'm going, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't no, see in my own songs. <laughs> Have you ever encountered monitor problems, Andreas, when you play live? I've done so many years of uh, uh, live vocals before in-air systems were even on the kind of a chart here. Yeah. So uh, the, those monitors, when you were playing, especially when you were playing in kind of a really harsh band, death metal, black metal band, uh, <laughs> there's so much distortion going on, uh, so much loud is going on. So it's very hard. And then you all, you all need to hit that clean uh, note, and you don't hear really what is the note because it's. That's right. so, so that's uh, yeah. It's, it's been been uh, one of my uh, bigger problems when. Playing live with you know, in this more kind of harsh metal element kind of bands, that you it's very hard to really hit the notes. Uh, well, not to hit the notes, but you, you need to hear where, where's the tone. I hear a lot of noise. Right. I don't hear the tone. <laughs> it's a lot yeah. of noise now. And we weren't all fortunate to be born like Johanna and not need a PA system. Uh, James, we're going to the, this game now. Uh, pick your pick your favorite guitarist, because uh, John mentioned a couple of them. And I've, I've, when I was younger, I was like, oh, okay, this kind of guitar hero. Uh, I was listening to a lot of them, but the guitar hero uh, kind of um, emblem was put on Ingmar Malmsteen and stuff like that. Mm. But it, it could yeah. be all other guitar here. So I will show seven of them. And you have to pick one, and uh, oh. it's six albums. But one is uh, because it's two guitar heroes on the same album. Okay, we start with this one. So the game is on. Cacophony, and this is Marty Friedman, Jason oh, Becker. Jason Becker. Ah, 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 yeah, I remember ah, that one. Then we go to Jeff Beck. John. Uh, yeah. Frank Zappa. Ooh. <laughs> and the uh, famous. Ingvill. Ah, there <laughs> And the guy who doesn't you like mention cancer. was in another album, Joe Satriani. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the legendary Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Your fave. Man, you know, that's a good question. You know, I would actually, I would, I would say my favorite's not on there. <laughs> Tony Iommi, right? Well, Tony Iommi uh, for the metal stuff. Um, for straight up rock and roll, you know, there was a guy named Tom Schultz that changed the way guitar sounded forever. Um, he played for a band called Boston. Ah! Yeah. And he was amazing. Uh, there's another guy that, that gets a lot of heat now, but this guy really fired me up. I mean, Van Halen, because I was a guitar player, okay. everybody yeah. was uh, impressed with him, but the guy who really made me practice like eight hours a day was Ted Nugent. Uh, when I heard Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang Double Live Gonzo, I was done, man. Not only could he play fast, he could scream and, you know, jump around like a maniac. And uh, the intensity that he had uh, and I, I grew up in such a controlled atmosphere. This guy was so completely the opposite of everything in my world. I just couldn't get enough of it. All of the albums I showed, none of them. Oh. So, wait a minute. So Frank Zappa, Frank Zappa was an inspiration, number one, because he lived in my hometown of Baltimore. Oh, yeah. One of my all-time guitar heroes, Steve Vai, played with me. Yeah. 
here's the first DIY flexible. There you go. So flexible. Sorry, I, I sorry, okay. I forgot that one. So that is an amazing yeah, album. Yeah, that's an amazing album. And that, he's doing so great stuff with uh, Frank Zappa as well. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but here's here's the thing. Frank Zappa landed, the spaceship landed, and brought him to Earth in the '60s, and then. Uh, in the late 70s, another spaceship came and dropped off Steve Vai. Yeah. Uh, Mateus, who's your guitar hero? Oh, wait, we already know Mateus. Why are we asking you? <laughs> He's already here. <laughs> so. Yeah, but, but it's not the only one. I, I have a, I'm a big fan of Alan Collins. Really good. And I, I can't, you have a, almost like a kind of Alan Collins feel to your solos as well. Where I grew up, there was an awful lot of Skinner fans. Yeah. And so you you could not go to a party or a jam session if you didn't know half a dozen Skinner songs. That was the thing. Where I grew up, you might have one drummer for every six guitar players. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it's say, universal. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was like it was like Hollywood in the '80s. You couldn't swing a dead cat and hit a guitar and not hit a guitar player. Yeah. You know, <laughs> in the '80s, if you walked down Hollywood Boulevard carrying a guitar and had long hair, you were going to get signed to a record contract. It was just the way it was, you know. But uh, yeah, so we did play a lot of Skinner back back in the days, you know. <laughs> My favorite part of that was Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I remember a lot of the years, you know, after I left Danzig, I, I wasn't playing, I was doing some other things, but I would get phone calls and stuff. When the video games started coming out, Guitar Hero and Rockstar and all that, you know, they would say, yeah, mother's on Rockstar, mother's on Guitar Hero, blah, 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 blah. And then people would say, you're the guy from that video game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Simon, go ahead. What are some of your ba bass heroes or guitar heroes? Ah, black magic. Geezer, Lemmy, yeah. <laughs> Cliff Burton. Andreas Hedlund. <laughs> Hey, yeah, I'm the greatest guitar and bass player, yeah. right, Simon? Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. Oh, no. yeah. Did you say Cliff Burton was a great bass player? Yeah, awesome. You know, um, I remember when he passed away, and um, when we met Metallica, when I met him for the first time, he hadn't been gone that long. And I had seen Jason Newstead and Flotsam and Jetsam. Uh, when they were coming through in Baltimore, when we were on tour with Metallica and Jason, you know, we were talking and hanging out and everything, you know, he said, yeah, it was kind of like a, just like a surreal thing that happened and how, you know, he was just out there with his other band cranking along and all of a sudden, you know, this tragedy, um, yeah. But, yeah. but he had to go for it, you know, and suddenly he was just catapulted from club band into arenas yeah. and well okay i said you know what i said on a smaller scale i experienced the same thing because i was at the university studying i wasn't even in a band at the time when i got approached to audition for sam hain so it was sort of like you know i did it almost as a favor to a friend next thing you know i'm in a band and we're getting signed to def jam records and recording in the studio and our first session we're working on a movie soundtrack uh, with Roy Orbison for that movie Less Than Zero. You know, it's like all of a sudden yeah. I, 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 I'm going to the movies, watching this movie, and I'm hearing my little rhythm dinky guitar in the background oh. of the scene. They're in a car on the radio and their song, and I'm going, that's me, I'm a member of the Power and Fury Orchestra, and that's Roy Orbison singing in the background. You know, we hadn't even done one dancing track yet, and we're already on a movie. So it was like... People were like, "Oh, you're spoiled. You got lucky." And I'm like, "Yeah, I did. I got really lucky." Yeah, being in the in the right uh, place at the right time is uh, the key to everything, I believe. Meeting the right people. Yeah, you you can't 
you can't plan for that, right? Sometimes no. you just you just go with it, and it's either gonna work or it's not. I mean, if you have a good opportunity and you're prepared, and you are what they're looking for, then the sky's the limit. Now, Mateus, I have a question for you. Yeah. Which guitar did John record with Lucifuge? If you're such a big John Price fan. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna just take a guess and say it's the BC Rich Pitch. Okay, so do you know which one? Oh, no. You're disappointing me, Mateus. <laughs> so everyone knows the primary one, which is this one that I'm holding here, right? Yeah. And actually, funny story, I digress just for a second. This, uh, one of the stories about this guitar is on our trip, on our maiden flight out to LA to open up for Slayer, this guitar, uh, the neck got broken um, when they were throwing the baggage out and they threw the bases and stuff on top of the guitar. And the, the neck, I got back to the hotel and the neck was snapped. Oh man. So I had one less Paul um, to do the show with, but you know, the high notes on Mother aren't on that guitar. Yeah. So the only way that I can play those high notes is to go to the, the highest fret on the Les Paul, take my pick underneath the E string, pull it up, and then grab the string with my other th three fingers on the right hand and pull it all the way up. So about 50% of the time, that string's going to break. <laughs> so I might get... I might get the F sharp or I might get close to it, you know, and hopefully, but then I won't hit that string for the rest of the song, you know? So, but I get to the gig and I'm like, I'm upset because I'm like, oh crap, you know, we only got one guitar, what am I gonna do? The good news was BC Rich was in California, so they took the guitar. Bad news is I only have one guitar, so I talked to Kerry King. I'm like, my buddy signed it for you too. Find a place where you absolutely hate it. Well, you probably will, but you can probably throw it out. But it's true. It. At uh, the Palladium, yep. and he agreed to let me borrow his Red Mockingbird and uh, play that. And that was the best feeling sounding BC Rich I'd ever played. And I've been offering him money for that guitar like every five years, and he refused to sell it. <laughs> so, getting back to the second record. So the second record, um, you know, we'd been touring on the first record and we'd moved to LA and we were doing all this kind of stuff. And I only had the one BC Rich and I was looking for other ones. Um, uh, and uh, Rick Rubin was friends with uh, LA Guns, Tracy Guns, and he had a lime green one. So Rick bought it for me and we gutted it and painted it black. Uh, we put all the hardware back on it, threw a Kaler on it. And uh, it sounded so good that I used that one primarily on the Lucifuge record, especially um, Devil's Plaything and Her Black Wings were the big ones for that. Right. Mateus, did you know that? No, I didn't know that, but now I know. Oh. Now, Mateus, can you show John your guitar? That you yeah, and uh, I think uh, Andreas will recognize this one as well. If you hold on a second. <laughs> Take that on. Good luck. Simon's still not impressed, John. <laughs> yeah, Matthias is back. So he <laughs> entertained right. us. Oh, I was just playing back yeah. right when we came back. So right, we're entertaining Matthias, during the break. So uh, if you're talking Beast Rich Bitch, uh, this is not a Beast Rich, but it's uh, kind of like a bitch. <laughs> ah, nice. Yeah. It's a little special. You see, it's a different head, but. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Formula. And this was actually one of Andreas' first guitars. Yeah, that one has uh, been in my possession for some time. Yeah, 
And this is yeah. really going back in time now. Oh, wow, that's yeah, what he is. Yeah. This is a this is time traveling now. Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> mind yeah. mind traveling. Does that guitar sound good? Uh, I haven't actually played it for a long while because it's yeah. missing a lot of parts. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I think it's uh, sounding quite. So what's right. what's your main guitar? I play on a Gibson Explorer. Oh, nice. Yeah. Now, are Gibson pickups or? Yeah, PMP? it's a stock stock pickups. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I started actually playing on a Jackson Dinky, and uh, then I tried. Uh, I bought a Jackson Kelly. Uh -huh. I like the balance of it. it right. It's like, was so easy to play. And it was. Yeah, it just hang really good. Nice I went way. on to Gibson Explorer, and I'm never going back. What was it first? Was it just the sound of it, or the feel, or just both? It's both. Both. And in combination with uh, my amplifier, I use a Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. Oh, okay, okay. And it's really good for everything from like blues to metal and stuff. So I really like that. I remember so. when they first came out, the dual rectifiers, because everybody was using the Mark IVs before that. Yeah, yeah. And stomp boxes, and um, right yeah. before that is when everybody was using these uh, MP1 processors. Metallica yeah, yeah. was even. Uh, these horrible little processors and yeah. uh, do, you, do you all remember the the zoom processor <laughs> oh, yeah. and it was inside a tube or something like that everything sounded yeah, so it sounds hard. awful andreas what about you what's your main axe he's yeah, asking about my axe. main axe the vintosaur symbol is imprinted in it actually it's kind of a explorer type of setup but it's a custom wow. made one nice yeah Nice one. A nice now, one. Is that, is that a Floyd Rose on it or, or an Ibanez Floyd yeah, Rose? It's, yeah, it's a Floyd Rose. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I would rather. I'm I'm not Steve Y anymore. I, I like Steve Y <laughs> playing. I, I really like the Steve Y playing the the, the uh, Steve Y type of style, but I don't do that. This is the setup right now, and it feels really nice. And I've. I know this one for many years, and Matthias was one of the guys who was setting it up for me. And he was working at the guitar shop and was fixing it. And they were, and it, uh, yeah, the, the, we, we have this kind of symbol for the Vintosaur symbol. Yeah. Uh, I will have it. To, yeah, you see, I'm. <laughs> this one is uh, in the. Yeah. This one we have, and we have oh, it yeah. all imprinted on our albums and everywhere. <laughs> now we have it imprinted on my guitar. <laughs> So Andreas, you're not a tattoo kind of guy. A lot of people get like tattoos of like their logos or their names yeah. on their body. Are you ever going to get the Vintasaur circle tattooed on your body or <laughs> yeah, maybe your well, butt or something? Yeah, it should be because of the, we have so many fans that have it on their body. <laughs> we have the people have it on their arms, on their chest, on their back. I even got one guy that has it on, on the neck here. So. Yeah. I, I would, of course, be the one first to have had it, but uh, somehow I didn't. And uh, yeah, I just should have, mm -hmm. like, right? <laughs> Do what you want, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're I have some tattoos, but it's uh, it's not uh, that one, but uh, yeah. Hey, John, uh, Simon has his axe with him, so it's oh, let's nice. See, let's see. Oh, Rickenbacker. Hey, Simon, you guys got to send me some, uh, some t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> swag i would send you some danzig but i gave it all away look at that thing that looks beautiful yeah well it's an old 70s rickenbacker i think um i haven't really done much on, on this i changed the pickups to uh the rickenbacker uh humbuckers okay instead of the the original pickups a little more uh stronger mids a uh, lot louder output uh Kind of a little more uh, Lemmy Kilmeister-ish? Yeah, I think uh, Lemmy did use exactly those pickups, so... Yeah, uh, and you gotta strum it like a guitar out of Marshall amps. Yeah. Exactly. Simon, how long have you had that? I don't know, 10 years maybe. Um, I bought it on scene, actually. So Simon, I'm gonna start with the other question for everybody in the pedal, but I'm gonna start with you, Simon. What did you ever have any gear malfunction during a set? Well, I uh, used wireless once, didn't work out, so I just threw it away, plugged in cable, and that's it. Yeah. 
Andreas, what about you? Go ahead. I don't know. I think there's been so many different stuff. Uh, guitars not really working. You break your strings. You cables are not working. Uh, if you're not using cables, it's not working. So I guess I've been all across all over all those stuff. And I was, I mean, I've been a vocalist in Borknager. It was always all about that as well. Mics doesn't work. Monitors were, yeah, <laughs> coming and going. Yeah, you know, it was been, and then you, and I guess all you have played in a live with the monitoring, uh, the monitor guy, totally have the wrong setup so you get the drummers monitoring as a vocalist yeah, yeah. The, the drummer gets another guys kind of what they wish to have what they need to have to hear so i i guess i've been uh, all over that place uh i think i've never really ever never like okay stop the show i i think i just have to just have to go along and in the next song break you try to adjust stuff you try to fix stuff can i can't really use the old cliche the show must go on, but go on but you can't just break a song for oh now i don't get my perfect setup for monitoring <laughs> you just have to go and then you try to fix it as soon as possible i guess Matthias, go ahead well i i just had a, like a strings breaking and stuff nothing major but uh, I have to tell you about when we played in Montreal once, uh, <clears throat> Benny, our drummer, when he, the first time he hit like a cymbal, poof, the stand went down, whoop, and then he hit the next cymbal, poof, and that stand went down. Whoop. <laughs> so we started to suspect like there was a sabotage or something. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? A drummer without cymbals is like, uh, oh, it's yeah, love yeah, it's... space. Dude, I'll tell you too. Oh, please. Uh, first one was in Berlin. And we, we were, it was, I think we were doing two nights at this place and it was the first night and um, things were going along fine. And then uh, I came out, I changed guitars and I was coming out to start Mother. And so I come out, I turn the volume up, I hit the chord, a big, big gesture, wham, nothing, silence. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and I was wireless. I was wireless. You know, so yeah. there you have it. You're, you're checking the volume, you look over your shoulder, your tech, you're like, get out of here. You start wiggling the cords, trying to get the thing to work, nothing's happening, and all I could do is the spotlights on me, the room's dark, and I'm like, I'll be right back. <laughs> Go get another guitar and then come back out and start. That, that was bad, but we, we laughed about it. The worst one was we were just starting a European tour. We had just finished uh, How the Gods Kill album, right? So that was like, what, 30 years ago? Yep. And, okay, good. So, and we were headlining uh, the Pink Pop Festival in Holland. There's, it was our biggest show ever headlining. It was 117,000. Okay. And so it's, it's my first show with this new rig that Bob Bradshaw built in LA. And uh, it was great, it was amazing at rehearsal because it, that record, there were so many dynamic changes that I needed a switching system to do it all. Yeah. So we fly over there, um, it's the first show, go up, it's five minutes before the stage, my tech comes back and goes, it's not working. It was working, it was working fine, now it's not working, nothing's fine, he's having a panic attack. Yeah. The lights are off, there's nothing working. I can't get anything. I checked all the cables. I don't, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, just chill. And I said, you did bring the backup, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got the back. I said, all right. So I went with him. So I run up to the stage because now we got to unpatch everything and put the backup together. And, um, you know, and I had pedals in the back of, of the new rig that I was still going to use. So we had to pull everything out, run. Yeah extension cables and everything because it's a huge stage yeah and so now we're not even on we haven't even started yet they're starting to play the intro music i'm out on the stage duct taping down cables and pedals and all this and yeah. we're like 15 minutes late they're throwing bottles they're throwing mud balls <laughs> at me. they're yeah they're booing they're doing all this kind of stuff and then so i had to do my biggest show ever 
on my backup rig with one distortion pedal for all of those sounds. Yeah. And, and it was like, <laughs> oh yeah. The fans liked it, and and here's the kicker, right? I I would always have a debriefing after the shows yep. with our front of house sound man, the mixer, right? Uh, his name was Rick, and I would say, hey Rick, how was it for you? You know, uh, because I worked hard with him at Soundcheck. Is it didn't matter what it sounded like to me on stage as long as he was happy yeah. in the house, right? Um, and it was so funny because. He came back and he goes, he has a Jersey accent and he goes, he goes, bro, I know your rig didn't work. I know it went down. He goes, but here's the good news. He said, I was so far away from the PA system that the high end was blowing in and out with the breeze. <laughs> he said the wind would come along and the guitar would yeah. just go away for a second or two. And then it would come back. He said, nobody knew a thing. Yeah, you get this totally uh, big shows with the big uh, venues, big areas, open area, especially open area. You get all that, especially I, I feel that a lot of as a vocalist on stage as well, the, especially when you try, when you need to really need to, you have a lot of distortion going on. You need yeah. to find the tone to really, to really hit the tone with your clean vocals. And the, the sound is really blowing back and forth. It's kind of a flanger effect. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. John, when you make music, do you like collaborating with other guitar players? Or I I like it all, you know. Uh, whoever whoever wants to play, I mean. Um, Matthias, <laughs> we uh, you know, in, back in the Danzig days, we often entertained the thought about um, you know occasionally bringing out uh, a second rhythm player or something just to thicken up yep. the parts because on the studio albums you know the the, the tracks were getting so big yeah. and it's like man how how are we going to do that live you know how are we going to because i just didn't want it to sound when i go to do a solo or something i didn't want the bottom to fall out and be so yeah. empty you know and glenn said well i could play rhythm guitar he tried that once i was like nah you're all right you just you <laughs> Focus on the vocals. What about you and Mateus? Like, do you when you guys do your own solos? Are you like, all right, Mateus, you get the second solo, I get the first solo? How does it work for you guys? Mateus is the solo guitar. I'm more the rhythm dude, and Mateus are doing the more solos. I do more kind of, I guess, melodic solo stuff on more kind of a clean guitar sound ish. There, I feel more. Uh, that's more kind of my home area. I'm not this. Uh, well, yeah, that's my home area. More, uh, more kind of melodic solos, a little bit of a more kind of clean tone. But he's, so it's all about the the other ones. <laughs> and, yeah. So it's. Uh, I guess we haven't uh, really thought about it as much. It's been very natural. We have kind of divided it. Yeah, 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 it's uh, exactly as he says. It's uh, it's, it's kind of natural. It's always been like that. We don't write contracts, okay? I need three <laughs> guitar <laughs> songs on this yeah. album, so <laughs> I need my uh, time a... space here. <laughs> John, if Simon and uh, Mateus bring back the Danza cover band, they're like, "Hey, we need a guitar player, quick!" I know John. <laughs> hey, hey, I, so I know you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> conversation i think we have covered a lot of it's been about the writing process it's been about the sound the gear the, the sound the songs it's been everything so it's yeah. yeah oh this was a really nice one
Well, it's been an absolute honor. Uh, it's unreal. And uh, take care, man. Well, really good to talk to you. It was a pleasure to meet you guys, really. You know, what you're doing is great. Uh, I'm envious that, that you're out there playing and you're doing tours and all that kind of stuff. It's been a long time for me. You know, I'm trying to corrupt the youth of America uh, musically and yeah. tell them not to get a real job and just make it more evil and go out there and follow <laughs> your dreams. Uh, and uh, I look forward to turning some of my students onto your music and yeah. hopefully, you know, uh, get to meet you sometime soon and, and, and play together. That yeah, would be awesome. Uh, John, would you accept Vengerosaurus' offer to play on the next album? I might, but you know what? I'm out of here, but I'm going to play you out. Oh, 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 oh.